distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Daniel Fast. I'm the head of the Department of Sociology here at Trinity College. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this sixth event now in the TCB UCD Sociology Public Lecture Series. The series is supported by the Policy Institute, also here at Trinity College in Dublin. This flagship lecture series brings internationally acclaimed speakers, such as Professor Sami Zubaida, here to campus uh, to discuss contemporary sociological issues. It promotes informed and non-partisan debate and offers new ideas on cutting-edge sociological issues. This academic year, we've already had the pleasure of hearing Professor John Holdwood speak on universities in crisis, and Professor Valeria Mero gave a keynote on Muslim issues in Europe. I'd like to welcome and thank my co-organizers uh, who are here with us tonight, Professor Sinisha Malisevich and Dr. Andreas Hess of University College Dublin. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome and thanks to Jakob Buhanaya, who is again filming the event for us tonight. A few housekeeping rules next. Could you firstly please ensure that your mobile phones are in silent mode or switched off? And secondly, please locate the emergency exits, just in case. We'll shortly to have the great honor of hearing Professor Sami Zubaida deliver his public lecture on imagining national cuisines. Thank you so much for being here with us uh, tonight. It's a great honor for us. Themes of food, gastronomy, nutrition, and ecology have become increasingly prominent in public discourses and the global media added by movements of people and goods and the spread of diasporic communities in the West. This has stimulated definitions and constructions of ideas of national and regional cuisines with historical speculations on origins and diffusions. These themes will be explored by Sami in his keynote tonight with particular reference to the Middle East and the Mediterranean with comparisons also to other regions. But before we hear more on this topic, let me make one further announcement, namely that in a fortnight from today, the next uh, TCD UCD Sociology Public Lecture Series will take place right in this venue, Wednesday the 19th of March at 7 p.m. The speaker will be Professor Paul Schreffer of Tilburg University, and the title of his keynote will be The Open Society and Its Immigrants, A Story of Avoidance, Conflict and Accommodation. Registration for this event is already open via the Sociology website and email invitations are also being circulated. Our main speaker tonight is Professor Samir Zubaida. Professor Zubaida will speak for about 50 minutes to one hour and this will be followed by 30 minutes questions and answer uh, where you all have a chance to engage with our speaker as has become a tradition in this uh, flagship lecture series. We hope to wrap it all up by 8.30 tonight. I would now like to invite my co-host, Dr. Andreas Hess, to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you very much and welcome. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to occupy the stage for very long. I uh, just would like to introduce our and welcome our visiting speaker, Sami Subaida, who is um, speaking, as mentioned before, on imagining national cuisines. Sami Zuweida is uh, Emeritus Professor of Politics and Sociology at Birkbeck College and uh, also a associate and research associate in the Food Studies Center uh, at SOAS, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. His main research interests are religion and law, nationalism, as well as food and culture. He's done a number of books. Um, some of them I'll just briefly refer you to, Islam, the People and the State, Political Ideas and Movements in the Middle East, A Taste of Time, Fine, Culinary Cultures of the Middle East, Law and Power in the Islamic World, and Beyond Islam, A New Understanding of the Middle East. I should also stress, I don't want to read out the entire CV here, that Sami has been a visiting professor at uh, quite prestigious institutions such as New York University, and he's also uh, an esteemed uh, member of the editorial board of Economy and Society, one of the best journals for those uh, working in the social sciences. Um, I won't bother you anymore with my uh, words here and leave the stage and lecture on to Simon. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here in Dublin, Fair City. And I don't know that your national cuisine has cockles and mussels and I don't know. But that is, it's funny how that uh, song is known throughout the world. You know, people who are barely learning English, you know, would, if they are learning songs, one of the 
most common one in learning is about volume alone. And many of them don't know what cockles and mussels are. Um, now, national cuisine. Um, you know, I'm often asked, uh, what's your favorite cuisine? And it's always uh, in terms of nations, you know, do you like Indian or Chinese or, you know. And what do you think is the best cuisine in the world? Again, in terms of nations, you know, is it French or Chinese or Turkish or whatever. And there's always the assumption that cuisines are national. And in a sense, they are in terms of the sort of public discourse um, and the kind of explosion of these issues, as my colleague has already mentioned, in issues of food and gastronomy in public discourses in the media, on television, in relation to travel and cookbooks. Um, that uh, you know, the cuisines are always attributed to, to nations. Um, now, I want to just develop this theme a uh, bit in relation, not only I said initially that I'll speak mostly about the Middle East, but in fact, as it turned out, I've had a wide range of geographical coverage and examples. <coughs> national cuisine, like all things national, is a product of modernity and the imagination of the nation. Accelerated transport and communication, the movement of populations, centralized administration and common educational system facilitate the imagination of the nation. National and nationalist histories and myths drive this imagination into constructed genealogies, extending culture deep into history and origins. To take first a familiar example, Italian food is famously regional, but still given a national identity with the current global theater of food discourses. Indeed, it became, it became national, in a sense, as part of the unification of Italy in the later 19th century. And there is a particular theorist of this culinary identity of the nation, was a man called Pellegrino Artusi, who published a book in 1891, soon after Italian reunification, reunification, not reunification, uh, entitled Science in the Kitchen and the Art of Eating Well. This became the Bible of Italian food to Italians and others to the present day, bringing the regional foods together as Italian and codifying recipes and dishes and techniques. We're not surprised to learn that part of this exercise is to challenge French domination in the culinary field, stating Italian cuisine rivals French and in some points betters it, end of quote. I draw these accounts from a book by John Dickey, some of you may be familiar with it, called Delizia, the epic history of the Italians and their food. Not, he's say, not saying history of Italian food, but of Italians and their food. That history is one of the main cities and episodes of notable, notable, food, notable foods, cooks and patrons at different points in the history of Italy, but mostly in relation to particular cities. This brings us to another aspect of modern national food discourses the peasant and the rural setting. Um, peasant and rural roots of the, of the nation and culture are often celebrated in nationalist discourses. And this feeds into a folkloric performance of nationalism in many countries in Europe and elsewhere. And of course there's a shifting image of the peasant historically but in fact, in, both in Europe and the Middle East and many other parts of the world, traditionally elites had contempt for the peasant. You know, they thought, and I was writing recently about a particular Egyptian um, lit literary and religious man of the, uh, in the 17th century who wrote a, uh, a kind of satire on peasants and their food. Um, and he keeps throughout the 
his account, he keeps saying, thank God he did not create us peasants. You know, how terrible the peasant's life is. Thank God he didn't create us peasants. And that, this, of course, changes um, with, uh, you know, modern, early modern ideologies, you know, with people like um, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the physiocrats in France, uh, Adam Smith, to some extent, here, yeah, not here, in Scotland. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, more and more you see the, uh, the peasant and agriculture as, as uh, uh, a noble occupation and one on which, you know, the society depends. And then later on there is the romanticization of the peasant and the, you know, uh, one uh, popular. Uh, Egyptian song of the early 20th century was saying, uh, "How sweet is the life of the peasant!" And, you know, then, and the peasant then becomes the the kind of uh, national hero. The figure of the peasant becomes a national hero. So it's this shift, and so part of this uh, uh, romanticization of the peasant is to attribute uh, many uh, roots of the nation to the peasant, including the culinary, uh, the culinary. Um, now, um, in relation to Italian food, uh, Ditti argues that Italian food is predominantly that of the cities, of the elites and the urban classes, and that's un unremarkable. Peasants may have produced the food, but ate little of it, with a meager and, mon and monotonous diet into the 20th century. He quotes a saying in Italy, when the peasant eats a chicken, either the peasant is ill or the chicken. <laughs> we get a stark image of the diet and culinary customs of the French peasantry in the 19th century and up to World War I in Eugene, Eugene, Rogan, uh, sorry, Eugene uh, Weber's classic book, Peasants into Frenchmen, the modernization of rural France between 1870 and 1914, which came out in 1976, that's quite an old book. And then more recently, the book by Graham Robb called The Discovery of France. And the discovery in question is not about us discovering France, but about the people of France discovering France, discovering that they actually lived in a place called France, and a kind of national uh, identity and culture which is a, a more recent development. Uh, first, the um, uh, diet of the peasant, again, was meager and poor, a product of poverty, but also of isolation, confined to local subsistence and the seasons. So pr prosperous peasants ate the same food as the poor neighbors, but more of it. Rich food with uh, some, pe which some peasants produced, such as cheese and especially butter, was often sold and not consumed, ultimately uh, for urban and bourgeois consumption. Similarly with meat, wine and cider, bread, the staple for many regions, was often rough and hard, lacking the milling technology uh, of separating the, the chaff from the wheat and, prevent, and of preventing mold. Scarcity of fuel also reduced the frequency of baking, often in batches at monthly or even longer intervals, so that large loaves had to be cut with swords and axes. It would then uh, be softened in buttermilk or whey, and for the rich in white wine. The older, drier variety would be boiled this hard bread was sometimes moistened with the ubiqu ubiquitous soup eaten at breakfast. Uh, Café au lait was, is a great luxury which only spread slowly from the turn of the 20th century. So the soup was eaten at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and typically consisted of water, salt, and lard, sometimes with root vegetables in their season. For some, bread was a luxury, and the staple various kinds of porridge and chestnuts were chestnut were the bread of the poor, as well as staple as well as staple for porridge and soup with chestnuts. 
One survey in mid-19th century found that three-fifths of rural inhabitants hardly ever drank wine or even cider in Brittany. These produced, when produced, were sold. A typical poor drink in some regions was produced by pouring hot water over the skins and stalks of grapes after pressing the wine, then fermented. So they certainly wasn't baguettes and croissants at that time. And uh, it's interesting to note that um, uh, croissant in France to the present day is a category of pastries which are known as viennoiserie uh, from Vienna. Uh, and it was as attributed the origin of uh, the, that kind of pastry of the croissants attributed to Viennese origins. Um, French cuisine then does not have peasant roots. The idea, um, you know, at one point when people said, well, the reason why French food is so good and British food so poor, and it was earlier on in the uh, 20th century, uh, is because, you know, the French kept their peasantry and we lost ours. You know, they, but, you know, with the peasantry in, in much of England was eliminated in earlier enclosures and so on whereas France and Italy continued to be a peasant countries until mid-20th century in many cases. But so obviously that had nothing to do with the quality of the food given what the peasants were eating. Um, now, so French cuisine, which became so uh, dominant in Europe, uh, was primarily um, court, court cuisine um, and the cuisine of the elites. Uh, and was only later with the uh, development of the, of the restaurant and the food book and the uh, a, a public, of, uh, public eaters uh, that you had the codification uh, of French recipes as classics. But even then, it strikes me, reading um, books about French food from uh, the mid, uh, early or mid 20th century, such as uh, the famous Alice B. Toklas, uh, or even Elizabeth David. When you read these recipes, now they seem curious or displaced by later versions of uh, these uh, particular uh, foods. And of course, in more recent years, with all the fusions and the explosion of innovation in food and restaurants, they are unrecognizable. Um, now, apart from uh, food in uh, these particular countries and their regions, there are also the questions of diasporas, of the immigrant communities that inhabit in different places, particularly the United States. So much of uh, Italian food now, we consider Italian food, and is considered Italian food in Italy. Uh, the, Italian communities of the United States played a very important part in the development of and codification of these recipes, including the ubiquitous tomato. Ubiquitous tomato, of course, in, in initially came, as I have known to say, uh, from the New World. You know, so in fact, much of the what we associate tomato with the Mediterranean and Middle East and many other places, you know, is element of the cooking that was from there until um, you know, it, it was known from the 16th century but not really used in culinary way until uh, you know, sometime in the 18th century. Um, and uh, the uh, initial tomato was a different variety which wasn't very nice to eat. And so in fact the tomatoes that we eat subsequently is one that have been developed by cross breeding, genetic engineering. And a lot of that was done in the United States. So, um, uh, and so many of the tomato, the tomato varieties and the tomato sauces and the codification of recipes, of course, spaghetti and pasta and what have you, uh, were, was, uh, happened through the uh, diasporic communities in America. And now have many other examples in our country. Um, and one, while we are on Italy, there's the story of the pizza and the pasta. 
the pizza, which of course now is, is universal, um, in many respects is also a product of America. But in fact, these um, crusts uh, with oil on them and herbs and cheese and tomatoes are ubiquitous all around the Mediterranean region. You know, so you have, uh, you know, in the Arab Levant, you have what's called mankush, plural manapish, which is uh, crossed with uh, a mixture of herbs and spices and sesame seeds on, baked, and sometimes cheese over it, and, and so on. Um, and uh, in, uh, in uh, sort of also in the Arab Levant and in Turkey, you have what's now become quite popular in European cities under the term Turkish pizza, which is lahmacun, uh, meat on, on, on dough, literally, uh, in which you, know, you have the crust with spicy mincemeat and onions and parsley and so on, it's also baked. And a whole variety of other Turkish breads like that uh, called pide, and probably the word pizza has been common Greek origin, you know, pita, pide, uh, in Greece and Turkey. So all these were varieties of a, a, of a particular genre. And in Italy, it developed uh, in, in, uh, in Napoli um, quite late, you know, the accounts of it start in the late 18th century and only became sort of famous and established, uh, you know, again with Italian uh, unification. It becomes established, I don't know, it was famous in Italy. But where it became really famous and was developed into its present form was in the U.S. The, um, I once had a radio program. I wish I had recorded it or uh, remembered the name of the man who was being interviewed who claimed to have invented the American pizza. He said that in the 1940s or 50s, he and his uh, partner were running a Mexican restaurant. And uh, he, at one point, got really bad food poisoning from uh, the chef of the Mexican restaurant. So he went to recuperate in, 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 in his, or Italy, uh, his Italian. And there, then he wrote to his partner, who was in the USA, look, there's this wonderful stuff here, they call pizza, you know, we could do something with it. You know, and then uh, when he got back to America and they uh, decided on developing uh, this crust into a meal, you know, so the kind of so pizza pie with uh, uh, all the kind of great variety of different fillings over it. And then it became a world food as it is today. And was, and was pasta introduced to Italy by Marco Polo? You both heard that, I'm sure, that Marco Polo brought pasta from China to Italy. Um, well, there isn't a shred of evidence or reference which establishes anything to do with Marco Polo and uh, noodles or, or Italy. And indeed, all the historical uh, basis of the development, at least of macaroni and uh, spaghetti, is that it was really the hard uh, Durham wheat and its introduction, which was by the Arabs uh, in Sicily. They didn't introduce the macaroni, but they introduced the wheat with which then the macaroni uh, developed in southern Sicily and then spread to different parts. And of course, now this is another example of the codification uh, of uh, national foods in, in modern times. We say pasta, and we know it's a whole genre, you know, it includes uh, spaghetti, macaroni, um, uh, this, there's uh, lasagna, um, uh, ravioli, and all the variations on this. But of course, some of these are, are um, pies and, and dumplings and have had different sort of origins and different developments. And it's only recently that they've become codified as one uh, kind of genre of food, which is called uh, pasta. Um, <coughs> now, my other example um, comes from uh, India. I, um, I've done some research on sort of history of food in India and on the formulation, the, the idea of Indian food. And of course, India, a subcontinent, it's a, 
you know, got tremendous variety of populations and customs, and is highly segregated by caste. Uh, and a very important element of caste segregation uh, is uh, the prohibition on eating uh, certain foods. You know, it's primarily vegetarian for the higher castes, and also about mixing. Uh, in relation to food, you know, so there are strict rules for a high caste person of not only what foods he or she can eat, but who can cook it for him or her. Um, it has to be another high caste person. And there are also restrictions on um, who should be present while you're eating, who looks at you while you're eating. Um, uh, and that is why, you know, there is great taboo for high, for brownies. But troubling, you know, they have great difficulty in arranging trouble because, you know, they'd be exposed to all these polluting uh, uh, episodes. Um, and also the inhibition on public eating, you know, so there are no uh, real sort of restaurant uh, culture, public eating culture uh, in many parts of India. But you can't generalize about India, as I said, it's a vast place. Um, so all, in all these respects, it was highly segmented in culture, in, including in, in, in food culture. I have a, um, a friend of mine who is from a uh, sort of Brahmin caste tell, told me that uh, his uh, teenage rebellion, he and his other friends, was to go out and eat in Muslim restaurants so, <laughs> and eat meat. <laughs> so um, then. What happens in India, of course, you have this succession of conquerors and empires. Uh, I mean, one, of course, very important one was the um, Mughal uh, emperors who came, the dynasty that came from Central Asia, um, and became uh, gradually involved in the life of the country in an intimate way, in, uh, with a great syncretism between uh, Islam and Hinduism and between the different cultures, particularly the Emperor Akbar, who is credited with much of this mixing. And at a later stage, you also have the introduction of many courtly Persian themes into uh, moral culture, much like the introduction of French uh, themes into the British court after the Restoration. Um, and so as a result, you don't only have a, a highly developed meat uh, cuisine, um, but you also have uh, Persian themes like the pulao, the uh, rice cookery, um, and uh, the, uh, the korma is another, korma is a curious term which underwent, uh, which designated different foods from the always rich meat and ended up in India as being uh, you know, meat cooked uh, in yogurt or in cream with nuts. Um, then you have the Portuguese empire in India. And of course, crucially, the Portuguese introduced chili to India. You know, that's the tomato. Chili is a new world product. <coughs> um, and so, can you imagine Indian food without chili? And uh, they, you know, they, a lot of places in India, uh, you know, poor people didn't have much spices except the spices that they themselves produced. So it was ginger and turmeric um, and where they could get it, uh, pepper, peppercorns. So when the chili came, the great thing about chili is that it's cheap, it's very easy to, to grow and produce in lots of places. Um, and so it spread then in India and became what we now know as Indian food. Um, and the Portuguese, of course, also uh, brought in their own fusions of uh, food uh, uh, in Goa and, and the West. Um, and one of the, um, uh, the main foods that we are now familiar with is vindalu, which is a Portuguese word uh, meaning uh, uh, vinegar and garlic, and which was first cooked with pork and continues to be cooked with pork and by Christians. Um, then you have the British curry, and that became the most important because Britain was much more universal empire and a capitalist empire. 
And um, again, the word curry, the uh, genre curry, didn't exist in India. There is there speculation as to words in Indian food that uh, were similar to curry. And there is the Punjabi curry, which is uh, a kind of yogurt sauce with, with dumplings. Um, and there is the southern one of uh, caril, which the Portuguese adopted, which is a kind of uh, thin sauce with spicy sauce. So we don't know where, where the word curry came from exactly, but then um, the, uh, under British uh, uh, cult, you know, Indo-Indian culture and the British culture in India, it developed into a genre. So all these diverse stews with different kinds of spices became varieties uh, of something called curry uh, and acquired uh, regional designations like Madras and, and so on. Um, and then, of course, the crucial thing, as I said before, there was no, uh, there was no restaurant culture in India. It didn't have public eating except in poor markets, uh, stalls and so on, and mostly among uh, sort of Muslim and lower class people. Um, so the uh, it's really the British who, you know, recruited and trained cooks for their own households, and then uh, brought. Oops. <laughs> and, um, uh, uh, and it is the restaurant that codified Indian food as we know it. You know, into these different, you know, korma and Madras and Rogan Josh and biryani and pulao and what have you. This is part of the restaurant repertory. And what's interesting about the restaurants uh, is that the people who became the main restaurateurs and cooks did not eat these foods. They were mostly from a part of Bengal, which is now Bangladesh, uh, a part called Silhat. And um, they, they were the kind of sailors and the uh, servants in the, uh, forget the word that was used for them, uh, in the boats uh, that came and some of them jumped boat in, in Britain and the community of Silhati started in Britain and they were the main people who developed the Indian restaurant in Britain um, and their food uh, is primarily fish uh, and rice and they did not cook their food for their clientele, but cooked this uh, uh, repertoire of Indian food that we've now become familiar with. And then what's interesting is that spread to India. Uh, so in fact, restaurant food in India, for the most part, follows this. Unless, until, of course, in recent times, when there is this great uh, sort of global uh, emphasis on gastronomy on innovation as well as authenticity. This is really interesting. You know, people are being chefs and food writers are presenting things as authentic from, from X place, but at the same time new and innovative. And that is true throughout and that's happening uh, in Indian, Indian food uh, uh, as well. Um, you know, there's one Michelin star restaurant in London which is uh, serving um, uh, one uh, old uh, recipe from India which spread to the Middle East is uh, kitchri, which in Britain then became kedgeri, something entirely different. But kitchri was rice and lentils for the most part, poor man's food in, in India. Now this restaurant here um, has made a new kind of kitchri, they call Indian risotto. <laughs> it has prawns and all kinds of uh, prestigious things. Now, how am I doing for time? Um, so, I haven't said much about the Middle East. Um, and I've, we've got to half past five, but I am not. Um, anyway, I think. Um, I mean, in the Middle East, the Middle Eastern foods can be seen as variations on a theme uh, which have very distinct uh, examples in different regions. Um, 
but I just want, uh, and it, it's formed again for the synthesis that is brought about by empires, and of course the most recent empire uh, was the Ottoman. But nevertheless, so much of the food, even in Turkey, you know, you talk about Turkish food. In Turkey, so much of the food is, is regional until quite recently. Um, and uh, I like to talk about one particular region in Turkey, which is uh, the southeast, uh, the southeast of Anatolia, uh, on bordering the Arab Levant, Syria and, uh, Syria and Lebanon, uh, as well as including Cyprus. Um, and it's this region has quite a distinctive food. And what's interesting about the people of this region is they are, until quite recent history, ethnically mixed. So you have uh, both Turks and Kurds and Arabs who are still there, but you also have Armenians and Greeks who are for the most part uh, no longer there. And they share this food culture is quite distinctive. So I want to say that um, the as Turkish food, this food was quite distinct from the food of Istanbul. And the Istanbulus uh, were contemptuous of this Arab spicy food. Um, the, um, uh, it was also distinct from the Black Sea region, uh, which had uh, uh, sort of Georgian and Slavic elements in it. Um, it was uh, uh, distinct from the, I mean, it was common with the Arab Levant, Syria and Lebanon, that was quite distinct from the Arab food of Arabia or of Iraq, uh, to some extent also of Egypt, and certainly of North Africa. So I'm very amused nowadays to see on supermarket shelves uh, Moroccan hummus, which I keep saying must come as a surprise to the Moroccans. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, this is, um, uh, and so in relation to the Greeks, I mean, the, uh, it has, it has many things in common with uh, the Greeks of Cyprus, but not the mainland Greeks or the island Greeks or even the Greeks who were in uh, uh, the Aegean parts of Anatolia, the northern Aegean parts of Anatolia. So I want to say that food in this respect had much more to do with geography than with ethnicity. Um, and uh, uh, but then with the national appellation, everybody is claiming it for themselves. So, you know, Armenians say all these things are Armenian food. In fact, there are Armenian uh, restaurants in, Be in Beirut, uh, and people in, uh, and they serve this, this kind of food, and everybody in Beirut thinks this food is, is uh, uh, Armenian, whereas, you know, the Turks would be flabbergasted. But of course, this food has now become regional food in Istanbul as well. So, in fact, it has become Turkish food through the movement uh, of population. Now, I just uh, want a little time to say something about the Mediterranean. I've got to be in my bonnet about the Mediterranean. Um, uh, the famous uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel laureate uh, Turkish novelist uh, Orhan Pamuk wrote an essay once about the Mediterranean in which he said, well, he grew up in Istanbul and the Mediterranean was there. And uh, all he knew as he grew up, you know, his family went for picnics on the seashore. They, they were different seas. Istanbul is surrounded by seas. And of course, you know, in uh, traditional uh, Ottoman lore and Turkish and Middle Eastern lore, you know, you had the Black Sea and the White Sea. The Mediterranean was called the White Sea. And um, uh, the idea that this was part of a kind of civilization of culture called Mediterranean, he only realized what, uh, when he became a student and an intellectual and read all the stuff about it. And uh, I mean, what he argues, and he's not alone in that, is that the whole idea of the Mediterranean and the romance of the Mediterranean is really a Northern European invention coming with the, uh, many of the uh, writers and poets and what have you in the 18th and 19th century in Northern Europe, uh, seeing the Mediterranean as, as the region of light, but also as the region of the origins of their civilization, of antiquity of Greeks and Romans. Um, 
And um, so uh, the question then is, is there um, a kind of common cultural uh, heritage, a uniformity in cultures in the Mediterranean, which are determined by uh, ecological factors, uh, the, the presence of particular foodstuffs, the olives and the vine, uh, and then of course the whole idea of the Mediterranean cuisine, which has become uh, prominent over the last 50 years. Uh, people talking, um, first of all, Northern Europeans saying how healthy it was as against their unhealthy food based on animal fats and, and uh, dairy and what have you. And the Mediterranean is supposed to be healthy. Um, uh, olive oil, uh, uh, moderate amount of wine, fish, vegetables, and so on. Um, and of course, when you examine the foods of any of these uh, uh, the countries around the Mediterranean, then there, there isn't this uniformity at all. So, for instance, if you look at the Ottoman world, the Med Mediterranean Ottoman world, they didn't use olive oil. Uh, yes, they did use olive oil, but not for food. So it was primarily for lighting um, and for soap. Uh, and uh, by all accounts, uh, traditionally olive oil didn't taste very nice. Uh, you know, of course, if you could do it in a refined way, but most of the mass produced, the general production of olive oil wasn't terribly good to eat. And um, the uh, Muslim populations, well, you know, all the populations of uh, these uh, regions uh, cooked primarily, if they could afford it, in butter. That was the highest uh, uh, thing. And um, uh, also in uh, animal fat, you know, so the, the tail fat of the sheep. And in the case of the European part, well, they used uh, pig fat for the most part. And so this wasn't confined to the Ottomans and the Muslims, because if you look historically also at Italy and France by the Mediterranean, we found they did use olive oil, but not um, uh, sort of so dominant over over uh, everything else. That in fact, one of the things that is surprising, you know, the famous sauce now called pesto, you know, which you put on spaghetti and so on, um, and it's made with olive oil. But apparently, uh, in the in the Nice and Genoa area where it originated, until the 19th century, it was made with lard, not with olive oil. So um, this then uh, challenges the, the idea of the common Mediterranean food. Uh, but it had become common Mediterranean food precisely because now you have cookbooks and restaurants and what have you that serve Mediterranean, Mediterranean food. Um, so finally, I must uh, come to a conclusion which is to say that in the kind of global uh, scene in, that we have now, um, there are so many, as I kept repeating, sort of right, attempts at innovation and at recodification of food. And this happens also uh, very strongly because of the diasporic communities uh, in the United States and in, in Europe uh, who uh, try to uh, present their food. You know, in many, uh, in many uh, ideas about globalization, globalization is seen as bringing about uniformity. You know, the idea of Mac McDonaldization and you know, McDonald's and pizza and uh, Coca-Cola become uh, common everywhere. And so this is the effect of globalization, but in fact, there is a, a much more interesting contrary effect to this, which is that on the global stage, people are constantly trying to perform their identity in relation to one another and in relation to the media and uh, uh, the, the sort of dominant discourses. Uh, and in trying to perform their ethnicity, they are uh, reconstructing, reinventing, recodifying what they call their culture, including uh, food, food culture. So in fact, if anything, um, uh, globalization is bringing about uh, a greater performance of diversity and of diverse identities. And I will end with that. Thank you.
First of all, Sammy, let me let me apologise. One sneeze from UCD, namely myself, <laughs> caused the entire technology of Trinity College to collapse. It was absolutely, absolutely simultaneous with my uh, my sneeze. Um, however. Um, I don't disagree with anything you said, but as you know, my interest originally in this field was the study of the, the formation of haute cuisine, with particular reference to France. And France is really a bit of an oddball. Um, it's an outlier in the formation of, of, of an elite cuisine, and a, to a certain degree, a kind of um, a kind of French national consciousness from an early stage, so, you know, it's often dated from La Varenne's Le Cuisinier Francais, 1660, 61, 62. Um, it seems to me that everything you say about the codification, um, you're, you're talking about a more general process, but one of the earliest processes is the formation of haute cuisine associated with an elite, in that case a court elite, where they probably didn't give a toss about the rest of the territory and the peasants, but nevertheless, they appropriated from a very early stage the idea that this was French national cuisine because it was their cuisine, the cuisine of an elite. And I think you're, in, in what you're, you may have been con concentrating on the other half of the, of the story, which is um, problems of you know butterization and so on. <coughs> Okay. No, no, I accept that. Yeah. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm Ollie. I'm from the. Uh, I study here in my second year. I study French and Italian. Um, I guess also my own personal history is I'm from London, so I've had the mix, and I'm also Jewish, so I had to. Uh, religious aspect. That leads to my question, which you mentioned very briefly um, in talking about India and the, the higher class tendency to be vegetarian, which I think was to do with Hinduism. Um, I wonder whether it was maybe too big a, a question to ask about the role of religion in food and the spreading of national identity and cuisine, or whether you could talk a bit more about religion, the role of religion in food. Mm. Um, yeah, sure. Um, that's my uh, other uh, interest in religion. Um, yeah, I think, um, uh, of course, a re religion plays um, an, an important role uh, in determining commensality you can eat with food uh, and in establishing uh, social boundaries. Um, and so, you know, the prohibition of certain means of pork for Jews and Muslims, for instance, then rule, rules out commensality with people who eat pork. Um, the, the Muslim uh, supposed rejection of alcohol uh, also plays a similar role in, uh, in this respect. And of course, the, the most elaborate system of uh, boundaries and exclusion is in India, with the, the, the caste system. I tried uh, to describe it, um, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else one can say about it, except that it is a way of establishing social values. I reviewed a book uh, last year called Foreigners and Their Religion, um, Foreigners and Their Food, uh, which was really about uh, uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and historically how the, the various um, uh, prohibitions and boundaries were established in different places in relation to, um, and uh, you know, while, while the uh, Christians are supposed to have given up uh, the Jewish restriction, um, you know, there are no restrictions. Nevertheless, historically, uh, many Christians have refused. Uh, eating Jewish food or eating with Jews precisely because Jews were uh, in need of them and they rejected uh, Christ and so on and they were uh, whatever they are. Um, so you have, you, this is certainly a very common, common thing. I mean, of course, in the, uh, what's 
interesting about the development of public eating culture. You know, the, the tavern, the restaurant, the, uh, the, the food markets, and so on, is that in relation to modernity, it played a very important part in breaking many of these uh, prohibitions, like my prime uh, friend who is a teenage rebellion. Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Sarah Barry from the School of Medicine here in TCD. Uh, this is a question for you, but also for, for the interested to hear other people's views in the, in the audience. Um, you made the link, I understood you to make the link between nationalism and national cu cuisine um, as a way of co constructing that nationalism and that national identity. And there are some who would argue that in Ireland here we don't have a national cuisine. Uh, there are some who would say that we don't have an Irish national uh, cuisine. Uh, uh, it would be, you know, I'm not sure how we would define it. So if that were true, I find myself wondering uh, about our experience and history as a colonised people. And um, if that, if there is a lack of a national cuisine, uh, can we make that link? Or have you any reflections on that link that, that I am making? And maybe we're only beginning to think about a national cuisine. Thank you. Well, I, I cannot speak with any authority on, on this, you know, my, uh, my impressions uh, were that, you know, there was a great deal in common between the, the at least in modern times, between the foods of the British Isles and of Ireland. Um, and um, I don't honestly know what else to say, you know, I mean, there are uh, certain foods that were associated with the Irish, let's say, in London, and Irish pubs, they had uh, cremeen. Is it cremeen? Mm -hmm. huh? Cremeen. Yeah, cremeen, yeah. Uh, and, you know, that seemed to be even distinctively Irish. Uh, and um, in the US, of course, there are so many items which are associated with the Irish, including um, uh, what they call corn beef, which here is thought, of, and even also in the States, also thought of as Jewish. Uh, you know, salt, we call salt beef. Uh, which uh, is apparently common in Irish pubs in the U.S., but it's not common in Ireland. Again, as the diasporas are. Uh, so perhaps you can tell me, because I don't really know. I mean, I know there is modern Irish cuisine. You know, the, uh, the sort of what I think of as the Cork people. You know, uh, the Ireland, you know, the Berina Ireland, and so on. Who have put uh, Ireland on the map in terms of uh, uh, their cooking. On, but I don't know how much history that has. Thank you for your talk, Professor. I'm a master's student of politics in UCD. I'm from Mexico, and I was wondering if you have examples of how cuisine, cuisine or gastronomy can help integration between different cultures. For instance, in whole Latin America, you would have um, this cuisine resulting from the European and the Native American cuisine, so maybe there are more examples of integration between different cultures nowadays. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that common cultural, you know, some of the most sharp, the sharpest antagonisms are between people who share culture. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But well, I don't need to tell you that in Ireland. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll share culture, but um, uh, uh, within that shared culture, they express strong antagonisms on the basis of religion or class or what have you. Um, or the, the, the kind of uh, racist youth in Britain who eat in Indian restaurants and mistreat <laughs> Indian waiters, you know. Uh, um, so I'm not sure that, that uh, cultural uh, commonality or cultural, cultural integration uh, necessarily means uh, uh, national solidarity. Sammy, uh, my name is John Mulcahy. I'm just answering the question from medicine there. I'm from Fort Howard and I'm responsible for food tourism. <laughs> and I challenge the idea that we don't have a food cuisine. I think we, 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 we don't have an Irish cuisine. It depends on how you you uh, define cuisine, I suppose. But um, while it was influenced, I think, by colonization, 
Um, our cuisine is based on, on the excellent products that we've always had now and pre-colonization. And so our, our cuisine, our food has been driven by the products that we have, much like any other cuisine. And um, I suppose um, there is an emerging cuisine and it, it is probably a synthesis of, of all of that's happened and incoming cultures as well. Um, and I, I, I think there's an exciting amount of things happening around that. Um, but aside from that, um, Sammy, just in your view, from your point of view, um, do you view sort of imagining a national cuisines as being static? Or um, I took it from what you were saying that, that it changes. But is the rate of change getting faster, do you think? There, I read one actually <coughs> in the first issue of Gastronom Gastronomica. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel Lawton talked about how a, a cuisines these days <coughs> rotated every 50 years as globalization took, took place. Uh, have you had any comment on that? Yes, no, I agree with that. I mean, I, th I thought this is part of what I was saying was that, you know, there is this uh, uh, sort of invention and uh, uh, recodification and so on. But uh, I think a lot of people are attached to the idea of national cuisine. So this happens within, uh, you know, within the notion of national cuisine. And especially in diasporas, you know, like as I said about Italians in, in America and now uh, the various uh, ethnic communities in both in Europe and America who are presenting their cuisine to uh, their compatriots and to the world and in the process reinventing it. And of course with the uh, emphasis on innovation and authenticity in uh, public food cultures and in restaurants and media. Uh, this is a great mortar of, of innovation. Um, hello, I'm Claire Ann O'Keefe, and I'm in the unusual position of being a chef that's here this evening. Um, I'm a Scottish chef in Ireland, and um, I've come across this. I just wanted to comment a minute or two on the idea of national cuisine. Um, I worked um, as a very modern chef in Cooking a Modern Way, and I think it's interesting the whole discussion tonight has been about authenticity. And this idea of something that we've almost um, fetishised, especially within the restaurant world, um, and of this idea of something being authentic. And from what I took from what Sammy was saying tonight, is the idea of authenticity is really a difficult thing to prove. And I thought it was very interesting. Scotland and Ireland have this idea that although we don't have a codified um, sense of our own national cuisine, which is mostly to do, in my opinion, with the idea of colonisation. No one wrote down our recipes. There was no idea of a French cuisine kind of coming in and it being written down that way. The only recipes that I found that we have surviving are from what would be considered the big house. You know, if you were Scottish or Irish people who were working in a large English house. And there's certainly influence there. But um, I worry, and I'm, I'm not sure what Sammy thinks about this, but the idea of the fetishising of this idea of authenticity and us trying to recreate something that isn't actually there. Yes, there are fabulous techniques and we make some of the, definitely some of the best cheese in the world, that the produce is there, that the farming techniques are there. But I would worry a little bit about making a false history for food rather than just accepting that we are now turning what are our big produce into and letting it stand up for its own kind of sake rather than pretending that there's a false history to it. So I know it's long-winded, sorry. No, no, I mean, I agree with that. Uh, obviously, it's, um, I mean, I think there are uh, sort of national variations on common themes which have developed, you know, one, um, um, as a, <coughs> as an Arab Jew, I have a prediction for black pudding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I think, you know, you get uh, different kinds of black puddings in different regions in Europe, you know, and uh, the Irish is one of them, and I have some very fine examples of Irish black pudding. But how, you know, what, is that national, or, you know, is it a part of the variations on a theme, or, or the Irish breakfast, which is 
not that different from the Scottish version. <laughs> <laughs> Sausage feet. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Are you ready for another one? Yeah. Oh, okay. um, I just wonder, uh, any comments on Levi Strauss' famous culinary triangle um, and some of its uh, repercussions? I mean, some of those things seem to me to work, some others not. So, for example, about the distinction between endo and exo cooking, I mean, you find out, you know, who's standing by the grill or by the barbecue. It's always men, it's never women. Uh, so, you know, which kind of is a confirmation of Levi Strauss' idea, right? But then other aspects, it doesn't work so well. I just wonder whether you had any any thoughts on that. But I think you know these, uh, his idea of the uh, sort of structure of mind and uh, the way <coughs> these uh, shared opposites then appear in different uh, spheres of culture. He thought he came to, to say that these were part of the savage mind. They were prehistory. That history then uh, you know hot societies as it's called them. Uh, brought the transformations which went beyond that, even though I'm not sure I forgot by Levi Strauss how they continue to operate in the human mind generally. But my only, my big reservation, which I think Levi Strauss acknowledged about the triangle, um, is that uh, you, you only know nature through culture. But, you know, if you have your sort of nature is the raw and culture is the cooked and in between there is the rotten lane. Uh, um, but all, I mean, for everybody who deals with raw and cooked, uh, they are cultural categories. So, so for the human mind, nature doesn't really exist outside culture. Um, mm. For what it's worth. I can't actually, it's been a long time since I've uh, not any of it is drugs, so I'm <laughs> um, Hi, uh, my name is Zach from the Center for Genomic Gastronomy. And I wanted to ask you about supranational organizations. Um, 2013 was the United Nations Year of Quinoa. Right? And they're promoting this grain in part high in protein. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh. The Year of Quinoa, the grain quinoa. Ah, the yes, South yeah. from the yeah. Andes. And so you know, the potato and the tomato and the chili yeah. like, blew up and, and made it, and quinoa didn't quite. And so it's really interesting that the United Nations is somehow also promoting a certain cuisine. And so I was, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about um, the sort of supranational governance of... Uh, oh, oh yeah, culture. absolutely. I think that's very important. I mean, they, I did, didn't get a chance to mention uh, the slow food movement, which does its own mm -hmm. historical mythologization. Um, and that is very supranational, you know, it started majorly with uh, And of course, UNESCO, I mean, the, the idea of an intangible uh, world heritage, um, and one of the intangible world heritage is the Mediterranean cuisine, which I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, and of course, yeah, and, and of course, the, uh, all the kind of food writers um, uh, who are, you see, if you write a food column, every week and you have to write something different <laughs> then you you know you've really got to look for um, all kinds of new combinations or you know i think what i've noticed in the last year or so is the, the rise of the pomegranate um, <laughs> so everyone is now you know at one point you know i i used to just use pomegranate syrup very sparingly in uh, one particular one or two particular dishes um, and nobody knew about it um, beyond the people who used it in the uh, you know, Middle East and elsewhere, and Georgia particularly. And um, <clears throat> now it's everywhere, and all the supermarkets have started stocking pomegranate syrup, uh, and all the recipes that appear in the food columns in the uh, magazines, uh, you know, sprinkle. <laughs> the juice or the, the grains or what this and that. And so yeah, I mean I think that's all very supranational. Even though, you know, they keep saying, well this is Middle Eastern or this is Turkish or this is Italian or whatever.
my moment of glory. I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you made a connection at the end towards identity and uh, the, the way in which food has become central to people constructing personal identities. And that they, you know, they're Italian and, they're, and they have this, I'm going to be Italian tonight, I'm going to be, uh, you know, Spanish, etc. Um, and that, and that, when you said that you're linking that into globalization, so then there is this mix of, of the cosmopolitan gastronomy who, who is aware of pomegranate syrup and, and its importance. So that in this creation of cultural capital, and, and, and the creation of identities. Um, but then, when you said about the religious being an inhibiting force on the creation of those identities. So, I mean, if you're going to be strict Muslim or strict Jewish, it's very difficult to be cosmopolitan. But increasingly now, people are, you know, I've noticed the rise of, of first of all, there's vegetarian, then there's vegan, now you've got celiacs, gluten free. And, and, and this is also impact, impacting on, if you like, public uh, eating. So I have an identity. The first thing you say about me is I am see you. you know, in, in the same way as I might be gay, or I might be Jewish, or not, or I might be Arab. So that this statement about who I am, who I eat, uh, or I am who I eat, but that it's very crucial to, to, to personal identities mm -hmm. and the construction. So food is, 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 has a globalized dimension, but at the same time people are constructing their identities using like global food and products. Mm -hmm. Just a yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that, I mean obviously food is a great deal to do with identity. But then I think part of the uh, the kind of uh, variety and flux um, of modern society uh, is that you have always, you know, including people whose identities are to do with being gastronomes. Uh, you know, I think um, my old colleague Roger Scruton wrote a book uh, entitled I Drink, Therefore I Am. <laughs> um, so his identity is defining, you know, in terms of appreciation of wine and his, his autobiography through wine, as it were. And uh, I think, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, obviously uh, what, what you eat and drink is always to do with your identity, but that's not necessarily religious or national identity. It could be sort of class identity, cosmopolitan identity, identifying with uh, uh, particular tastes and uh. now do we have any other questions please? Isolated communities or 
urban quarters or religious groups, they don't think of authenticity. You know, it's, it's taken for granted. This is how we are. It's only when you come, when you confront the other, that then you have to uh, <coughs> present uh, identity as authenticity. Um, and that is when you construct authenticity. To say construct is not to say invent or that it's bogus, but it's to say you have, it has to be articulated. And to be articulated, you use elements from sort of your different uh, historical culture, from your uh, way of life, from your family life, or whatever, uh, to then present, to perform authenticity, to perform community and uh, ethnicity. So it's really, that's why the United States is such an important powerhouse of identities and of nationalisms of all kinds. It's precisely because uh, for a long time now, these different ethnic communities, all American, have uh, presented themselves in a common public sphere. And each one has had to re refine and uh, elaborate their identity. Um, my name is Fiona and I'm an artist and a chef as well and um, I recently had the experience of uh, cooking in a restaurant in Lebanon for a period of time. Um, you, you've been cooking in a restaurant? Yeah, yeah. in um, a restaurant in Beirut called Taule, Taule mm -hmm. um, which was set up <coughs> by a man called Kamal Muzawak who set up a farmer's market yeah. in Beirut which yeah, I knew you know. her. Um, so the premise of Tele is that the families of the producers from different regions in Lebanon come together and they're offered a platform where they can cook um, their regional specialities with those ingredients. Um, but the point I wanted to make was that um, I think a lot of what you're saying is that regional specialities or national cuisines are often developed or codified by the outsider, whether that outsider is a colonizer or an individual who has an idea of an identity or a political event. Um, I feel like now the true authenticity that people are searching for is one that just goes back to the land. And maybe that's what the slow food movement speaks about as well, but um, the only thing that I feel as a chef that you can do is just to look to what's in season, and that's the best way to, to follow to create food, slow food. I think that a kind of over focusing on what is national is um, quite destructive sometimes. <coughs> um, I found it really interesting in Lebanon that there was such a uh, obsession with national cuisine and it was brilliant in one way but there also seemed to be sort of a self consciousness with it that I found a little bit strange at times. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that, uh, <coughs> that Kamal is part of the convivium of slow food, <coughs> slow food movement, isn't it? Isn't there a slow, you know, it's part of the kind of branch of slow food movement in Lebanon. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, they are, they are either reviving or elaborating uh, uh, elements of um, ingredients and, and uh, ways of cooking, which is all to the good, you know. Uh, um, and um, I think one quite important element in the Arab Levant in this respect and in terms of national representation is Israel and the way in which um, uh, Israelis are seen to have uh, hijacked uh, Arab foods and their people Palestinians feel particularly strongly about this. There have been several books on this uh, recently and, and also, uh, you know, the kind of war over Hamas, uh, which always, I'm Falafel, and, uh, you know, I reviewed a book recently called Beyond Hamas and Falafel. Uh, uh, and, uh, it's, um, um, so that, that sharpens the kind of, uh, uh, national presentations in, in, in relation to food. And it seems odd, especially about Hamas, because now Hamas, according to one survey, 
uh, is present in uh, over 40% of all the household fridges in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's on every supermarket shelf. But then people are fighting whether it is, uh, I mean, it's obviously uh, originates in the Arab Levant. Uh, but then now it's become so universal. It's, uh, um, anyway, yeah, so there we are. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other questions, please? Thanks, hello. I'm Jeff Callan. I teach at Trinity College. And A. A. Gill, a uh, food critic, said that the invention of a national cuisine involves the elevation of peasant food and the development into a national cuisine. Listening to your description of French peasant food, I thought, well, no, A.A. Gill must be wrong. That couldn't uh -huh. possibly be true. But then listening to the discussion, I wonder, is, is there room for the idea not of trying to replicate peasant food in creating a national cuisine, but the idea of developing from peasant food into a national cuisine? And is that actually uh, what makes a national cuisine different from an elite cuisine or some other kind of cuisine? That makes sense. Well, no, I think all the kind of historical studies, I don't know what Steve still here, whether he's what he thinks about it, but it's not in the sense of the Yeah, he, he, he got yeah. about chess yeah. uh, connection. But, uh, you know, all the kind of historical accounts and what we know about, uh, you know, more recent, historically recent peasantries, if their food is meager and repetitive and monotonous, uh, by necessity, you know. Um, and really the, what we know of as sophisticated cooking um, comes primarily from other people, cities and uh, courts and elites, rather than uh, simple uh, peasant food. And when they take up uh, uh, peasant food, uh, you know, like the kitchery I mentioned, rice and lentils, mind you, even that I don't think was peasant food, but it's very old in India from as mentioned in the 13th century. Uh, but then, you know, you get this development into the British uh, category. You get this development now into Italian risotto and that restaurant and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, some maybe things that start off in, as poor food uh, are then made, uh, elaborated and codified in a more sophisticated way. We do have time maybe for just one more question. First one. Um, uh, uh, from um, uh, the School of English. I've been reading a lot of uh, um, travel accounts by grand tourists. Um, mainly um, 18th and 19th century. But uh, following on from the last question, uh, what really strikes me is um, how unappreciative they are of the um, uh, cuisine. Now, I don't know if this is just... Uh, oh, 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 oh. Uh, the grand tourists, mainly um, uh, English and some Irish tourists, yeah, yeah. travelling um, uh, mainly throughout Europe. And uh, they complain about the state of the roads and dirt. They always complain about the food available to them, yeah. not available in inns. Uh, is this just English and even some Irish dyspepsia, or is it interesting <coughs> that um, they're being served peasant food, which is um, sparse and monotonous? Um, uh, what do you think? Is yeah, I think it's the latter. Local food, you know, including. The food in taverns, you know, you have uh, uh, you know the, the histories that have been written, let's say, on restaurant, the, the rise of the restaurant in France from the uh, 18th century. Uh, the restaurant arose as a kind of, as the name indicates, restauré, restaurateur, etc. It's the story was mostly uh, sort of elite people who. who uh, thought they were delicate as we chests and needed restoring, you know, and so they had these 
sophisticated uh, purees and soups that are made for this new kind of establishment. Uh, but that is then contrasted what was public eating before it, including the kind of various uh, flavor, you know, caterers and salons. And the description of that is pretty dismal, but the story is not by stories, you know. Uh, and also the manner of eating, you know, the table d'hôte. You know, everybody came at lunch time and sat around one table, and, uh, you know, a dish would be plunged in the middle, and everybody would struggle for it to make sure that they got their fair share and so on. Uh, and that was Paris. So can you imagine what this would be like <laughs> out in the country? You know, so I think, yeah, the, probably, uh, you know, outside, uh, you know, refined society and home cooking and so on. I mean, eating uh, in public, eating in restaurants, in, this kind, in France it became respectable. But in this country, it really was uh, not until the rise of the hotel restaurants that, uh, uh, for refined people, especially ladies, to eat in restaurants became acceptable. Yeah, I think it's ladies, because before that, you know, various taverns and shop houses and so on, and clubs, clubs particularly, um, were frequented by men. Uh, so yes, I think um, the, probably the tourists were quite uh, quite correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sami Tsubeda, for a really very interesting talk. And thank you all for a very engaged, lively discussion uh, following this talk, uh, despite the technical glitches we've had. Um, We've at least two chefs in the house. Uh, we talked a lot about national cuisine, so let's go and eat. Thank you very much. <laughs>